Hello and welcome back. And this session is looking at a whole new area of unlicensed spectrum in six gigahertz and what that means uh, for Wi-Fi uh, in various different contexts. This is something I've been watching for some considerable time and it's a really exciting time uh, for the whole of the Wi-Fi industry uh, and what we can essentially do uh, with six gig that we haven't previously been able to do with 2.4 and five. And I think we see some large changes over the next uh, coming years on that. And here to present on this is uh, Scott Imhoff, who's the Senior Vice President of Product Management and Planning at Cambium. Um, play the video, please. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. This is an unusual experience and an unusual opportunity for Cambium Networks that perhaps is a positive benefit of COVID. It'd be virtually impossible for us to get together with our end users around the world at one time, uh, other than doing it virtually. So we're gonna make the best of the situation and bring you some tremendous information today. Uh, my particular session on six gigahertz is relevant to our global audience. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of this information with you today. So with that said, let's jump into it. And I wanna start with perhaps some clarification. And you will hear uh, myself, I suspect, and others use six gigahertz and six E synonymously. And to a degree, they are synonymous, uh, but to a degree, they're not. So six gigahertz is just that. It's the RF band that is being opened up around the world. Uh, and six E is the specific implementation of that six gigahertz for Wi-Fi. Uh, the E incidentally stands for extended. So six gigahertz and six E uh, are, are in some cases synonymous, uh, but, but think of them uh, independently, particularly when you're contemplating fixed wireless broadband and six gigahertz. So I like to always start with who cares? Why are we doing this? So first of all, it's up to 1200 megahertz of clean unlicensed spectrum. I think unlicensed is the key word there in terms of investment in spectrum and access. The, the regulatory bodies are endeavoring for thoughtful allocation for both indoor and outdoor use. So going back to the comment on 6E for prim primarily indoor, but not exclusively, and fixed wireless broadband for outdoor applications. Wi-Fi 6E does exclude backwards compatibility with A, N, and AC. And you might say, wow, that's challenging. But in reality, it's a good thing is it, it cleans up uh, the less efficient standards uh, that, that come before 6E and make for the most efficient use of that new spectrum. We can support up to 160 megahertz channels and that translates to significantly higher data rates. Lower latency. Historically, Wi-Fi has not been the best uh, transport for uh, internet Industrial Internet of Things, IIoT, certainly uh, viable for, for consumer and home uh, type of, of networking, but the latency really prohibited it from machine to machine, and 6C addresses that. And it includes uh, the need in the case of the FCC and, and other markets around the world, the use of an automatic frequency coordination service to protect the incumbent users of licensed microwave. So what I just kind of went through is some high level summaries of speeds and feeds. Uh, and, and from a product standpoint, th those are important and they're, they're enablers. But the really who cares is you. And why you care is what you're going to be able to do with this six gigahertz spectrum. To be able to better open up the digital home for pleasure, for work, for study, uh, for control and management. The advancement of AR and VR, again, for work, study, and play is advancing quickly, but it requires significant bandwidth to be effective. Advanced surveillance systems around the world, growing and extending. The digital classroom, whether it's in the classroom or remote or hybrid, ever greater use of technology in the learning process. In the fixed wireless broadband space, being able to deliver gigabit to the edge, machine to machine for industry 4.0, many, many more applications are gonna be enabled 
by the use of that up to 1200 megahertz of spectrum. And that's why we care. So let's touch a little bit on the status around the world, starting with Etsy. Nice progress. Uh, there is a what's referred to as a stable draft, and it will likely be finalized in the official journal in March of 2022. Further, the six gigahertz spectrum itself will likely be harmonized across the EU. And that's fantastic because it makes for a common platform, common uh, interoperability, uh, makes it easier for manufacturers to develop product, but more importantly, makes it uh, significantly easier for end users to have a reliable solution. Now, the downside to Etsy is at present, the very low power makes it almost economically unviable for outdoor use. And I've highlighted that in red above and provided some comparisons to the 5.4 and 5.8 bands, and you can see why that is. So hopefully some movement on that in the future, but at present, uh, it would seem that six gigahertz is going to be optimized for indoor use only in Etsy governed markets. On the FCC front, 1200 megahertz of low power indoor, phenomenal. 850 megahertz of outdoor with the use of automatic frequency coordination. The, the standard itself is well underway. Uh, there are some elements uh, formally called a further notice of proposed rulemaking that are underway. And th those are progressing. Uh, there's been some recent publications from the FCC on those. So those will be worked out, I'd say, in the coming months. Uh, there is a legal petition to set aside uh, the report and order, meaning uh, do away with the use of six gigahertz. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a moment. So that's a, a bit of a hurdle in front of us. On that front, the petition uh, was initially uh, requested an emergency stay. Uh, that emergency stay was denied, and now they've moved forward in a, in a more detailed uh, legal review of the request uh, to set aside. And the basis of that was that the FCC lacked a reason basis themselves, that they had not done sufficient analysis or study of the impact of opening up six gigahertz, particularly on the incumbent users themselves. And you can see there on the right hand side, uh, the petitioners are, are significant, they're meaningful. These are folks that rely on six gigahertz uh, licensed microwave for their wide area networking needs. Uh, they carry crucial information on those paths, and, and, and certainly it's important to them to ensure that they're not going to be interfered with and they can continue to rely on those licensed microwave networks. Uh, the courts have put forward a fairly specific set of milestones and dates associated with it. They've begun to check the boxes on those dates, and uh, Cambium's view is that we'll see a, a decision, a formal decision, uh, in the October 21 timeframe. But it is progressing, and, and I think the industry would agree that it would likely be um, addressed in a, in a timely fashion, and you would expect six gigahertz to progress. On the automatic frequency coordination front, uh, this is not a, a new concept per se for the FCC. I think they set, the, set a reference point with CBRS, Citizens Broadband Radio Service, and SAS services uh, as a viable approach. So uh, AFC is called out in the report and order. It's required for outdoor use and more specifically the high power outdoor use. And, and AFC is intended to protect uh, the licensed microwave users, the petitioners that I referenced in the prior slide. So it is intended to protect those incumbent users. It is not intended to coordinate new users, unlike CBRS, which does just that. So users of the six gig spectrum uh, with uh, AFC in place will still deal with prospective interference from other uh, non-licensed microwave users. And you can expect multiple AFCs to be approved and in operation in any geographic area. Uh, and, and the manufacturers and network operators will likely interact with multiple AFCs themselves. The report and order that the FCC put in place identified a multi-stakeholder group uh, to work through the details of the, I'll say the boundary conditions that the FCC put in place. Uh, that uh, MSG is being led by the Wireless Innovation Forum and the Wi-Fi Alliance, and Cambium is an active participant in those working groups. 
outside of Etsy and the FCC, uh, access to six gigahertz is opening up around the world. Uh, notable progress in the UK and South Korea and Brazil, the United Arab Emirates. And I suspect that this list is short. Uh, I suspect that there are other locales around the world that are actively opening up six gigahertz and you'll see that accelerate in, in the coming months. But it is underway and encourage you to take a look at your local regulatory environment to see what, what the state of play is. Uh, beyond the regulatory front, we are seeing the broader ecosystem uh, react to six gigahertz and 6E. Uh, certainly client devices are advancing. Uh, we're seeing sensor manufacturers and instrumentation uh, manufacturers with the lower latency for Wi-Fi uh, reacting favorably uh, to six gigahertz. Network design tools, including those from Cambium, are coming online. Uh, as with uh, any new RF band, the test and measurement tools need to be updated and upgraded and made, made available, and that's taking place. The development is, is underway on the AFCs. I've seen uh, some demonstrated already. And as you can see on the left-hand side, the industry groups are ramping the training and certification processes to make good use of this newfound wealth in spectrum. Now, there's also a question of, well, when is it going to be useful spectrum outside of the regulatory, uh, outside of products coming online, when are we actually going to be able to use the six gigahertz spectrum in the sense of client access? So a couple of data points to keep in mind. Uh, your mobile phone in today's society really sets the stage for utilization. And in the US, and I suspect that this is mimicked around the world, the average upgrade cycle right now is about three years, meaning uh, the typical mobile phone user upgrades their phone about every three years. Uh, a similar study uh, undertaken by Ting Mobile indicates that about 50% of the people uh, on their network upgrade their phone in a three to five year time frame. So two, da two data points kind of in that three year time frame. Now, this last holiday season, which tends to be a, a, a peak time period uh, that phones are upgraded as gifts and, and other reasons, uh, four of the really primary high profile phones uh, in the holiday season are listed there on the left hand side. All four of those phones are 802.11ax, that's good but they were dual band two, four, five gigahertz. They did not include six gigahertz. The first six gigahertz phone was actually just announced on January 14th and available. Again, I'm in the US, Chicago, Verizon has this phone now available. So January 14th, it became available and it's tri-band two, four, five and six gig. Uh, the kicker though, the retail price is $1,200. So this is not the everyman phone. Uh, we do not expect uh, a common phone to support six gigahertz until the fall of 21. Laptop vendors are also progressing. Uh, a good example is uh, Intel's AX210 uh, platform, and they're expecting that to be available mid-2021. And you would expect a, a similar approach initially available on their higher tier uh, laptops and tablets. Put that together and what that suggests is, is we won't have critical mass penetration, in our opinion, until Q2 2023. What that means is, uh, if you think about the cycle on, on rotation of phones and, and clients like laptops and tablets that can make use of six gigahertz, there's really not gonna be a preponderance of clients using six gigahertz until Q2 2023. So you've got time. Now, you may have older Wi-Fi networks deployed within your enterprise and your business today. So what do you do? Do you wait? Well, no, you don't wait. There's an enormous population of two, four and five gigahertz clients that are going to persist for a long time and can take advantage of Wi-Fi six and you can lift the performance of your network significantly independent of six gigahertz. But what you want to think about in making those investments in a six gigahertz platform, even though it's not going to be used significantly until that 2023 timeframe is how you handle that transition. So you can think about on the, uh, if you look at this slide, 
If you're making an investment in six gigahertz, six E in the 2020 timeframe, do you have a software defined AP? Do you have a tri-band uh, uh, AP, Wi-Fi AP? Because near term, two, four and five gig are gonna be the dominant bands and you wanna be able to allocate the computational horsepower and RF horsepower of that AP to take advantage of two, four and five gig. But at the same time, as the client population of 6E devices ramps, you want to be able to start to allocate capacity on that AP to 6E. Can you do that? That's really the operative question. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of a recap here. Uh, six gig regulatory approval. Check your local regulatory position. Understand the distinction between indoor and outdoor. Are you deploying the fixed wireless broadband at six gigahertz? or are you most interested in indoor 6E? Etsy and FCC are great reference points. Uh, many regulatory bodies around the world refer back to Etsy and FCC, but they do not necessarily dictate the local requirements. Pay attention to what's going on locally, uh, reach out to your Cambium representative and we can help you navigate through that or, or show what information we have available at that time. On the device front, mobile phones are gonna set the pace. Uh, that's the reality of today's society. Laptops and tablets will trail. Uh, and really what you want to ideally uh, align to is the tipping point on device penetration. On the Wi-Fi access standpoint, tri-band is absolutely the way to go. Uh, two, four and five gig will have a long tail. From a five gig standpoint, probably infinite tail, uh, but it's a tri-band AP is the key. You want that unit to be software defined. You want to be able to optimize the computational horsepower and the RF to the, the density of devices, whether it's two, four, five, or uh, in 2023 forward, six gigahertz. And of course, uh, Wi-Fi 6C certification is, is crucial. Uh, don't invest in an AP that isn't certified. That'll protect you and your customers. So really what you want to do is a line on the intersection of these three core elements, regulatory approval, software defined radio, and device population. Having said that, there's no need to postpone network upgrades. If you're contemplating an upgrade to Wi-Fi 6, proceed forward. You are gonna have five plus good years of performance given the density of devices that are out there using five gigahertz today. If you are making that investment and you're contemplating the use of six gigahertz, ensure that that radio is tri-band, ensure that it supports software-defined uh, radios, and, and that'll give you uh, maximum flexibility and agility in managing your network. From a Cambium standpoint, uh, we are tracking right along with six gigahertz. Uh, our first six E radios for Wi-Fi will come online in the second half of 2021. Uh, they will be tri-band, they are software defined, they'll provide you that investment protection. On the fixed wireless broadband side, both our ePMP platform and PMP 450 platform will support six gigahertz. Uh, different approaches and different considerations, uh, probably best discussed with your uh, Cambium representative, but on the ePMP front, uh, 496 QAM, 160 meg channels, the ability to support gigabit to the edge uh, inherent. On the 450, uh, PMP 450 uh, platform, you'll see us uh, support dual band, two carrier aggregation, path to fixed 5G, very, very important. So in closing, I think we all know this saying, all good things take time. Cambia's first touch point on six gigahertz was April 23rd of 2017. I had to go back a long way in my email records to find that touch point. For those of you that are doing the quick math, that's 1,400 days ago from today that we began this journey. And that's not atypical of investment in technology, uh, particularly when regulatory changes are necessary. But patience leads to good things. And the time has come for 6 gigahertz and Wi-Fi 6E. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, that's a really good uh, overview of everything that's going on in six gig. Yeah, it's, it's certainly one of those really fast moving areas that, um, yeah, every time I look at it, there's, there's been new regulations and, and start of new products as well. Um, 
so for people listening in, um, you'll find the Q&A box uh, for text entry of questions underneath the video window. And also, I'd like to ask the organisers to push out a poll about six gigahertz now, please. And you should see that popping up on your screen um, you know, at any moment now. Um, that'll take a couple of minutes to get the results in. And so uh, I'll kick off with some questions, uh, Scott, in the meantime. Um, so from the sound of things, it, it sounds like it's possible to essentially have forward compatibility with existing products for, for six gigahertz when it arrives. Is that a reasonable way of, of um, uh, describing things? Well, yes, with respect, obviously, to support in the context of two, four, and five gigahertz on Wi-Fi, and perhaps you know five gigahertz in fixed wireless broadband, uh, it's doubtful, and it certainly is the case with with Cambium, that none of our radios, with some minor exceptions for some specialty products, uh, support six gigahertz today. Uh, so, so as we move forward with the availability of six gigahertz, uh, new hardware iterations will come forward. And, and we do expect those hardware platforms just to be backwards compatible with regards to five gigahertz. Um, and the existing legacy products will continue to operate, obviously, at five gigahertz going forward. Right. OK. Um, so it sounds like when I mean, all of this, you know, as I'm, I'm well away, it does change very rapidly. And, and um, there's the, the the review process in the US from the FCC that they were saying. And I know, you know Etsy is looking like it's going forward. How can people stay on top of where we are at the moment. What's, what's a good source of news and updates on, on 6 gig? Sure. Well, uh, with respect to Cambium, my, my recommendation is to subscribe to uh, the community, the Cambium community, and, and be, a, a you know, if, if nothing else, a passive participant in Cambium community and watch the post and, and at best and encourage certainly everybody to do this, to be an active participant. Uh, Cambium community is a, is a great source of information. Our product line managers and our development engineers are very active uh, on the community, and, and that'll be a, a good place to track where we're at from a re regulatory standpoint, where we're at from a product standpoint. And then within the industry itself, uh, you know, the, the six gigahertz is top of mind within the industry, and Furious Wireless and other publications uh, certainly have a, a pretty regular stream on the status there. Yeah, no, I also, um, you know, Klaus at Wi-Fi Now does a really good job Perfect. of staying staying on top of six gig. And I suppose I should probably plug my own Twitter yeah. as Disruptive Dean as well, because I'll, I'll mention it among all the other stuff that I talk about, because it's, it's clearly an issue. Um, OK, H how do you see um, when this becomes real? H how does it change the game in, you know, things like enterprise and industry verticals. I mean, we hear an awful lot about, well, we're talking Vibu just, just before about, um, you know, 5G and Wi-Fi. And it does Wi-Fi 6E allow us to do more of the lowest low latency or time sensitive networking? Where, where does it fit in that, that end of things? It, it does. And, and I think that's one of the challenges with in the industrial internet of things where certain, certainly Wi-Fi is being used there today. Don't take me wrong. There's lot, lots of uh, entities, enterprises out there using Wi-Fi to network their sensors and instrumentation. Uh, but in the most latency sensitive applications, uh, Wi-Fi may not be the best solution that's available out there and alternatives like BLE or Zigbee and uh, proprietary protocols have, have really carried the, the freight there, uh, LoRa, uh, for example. But I think Wi-Fi 6, the combination of the latency uh, and, and the clean spectrum uh, is going to really accelerate Wi-Fi's use in those types of applications. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I've been saying for several years to you know, Wi-Fi Alliance and vendors, why aren't you talking about latency? Because all the 5G guys are. And it's really good to see the Wi-Fi part of the wireless industry catch up. And I know there's some of the things I've seen around Wi-Fi 6E have been talking about two milliseconds as being reasonable, a reasonable goal, for instance. Is, is that something you're seeing as well? Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, it's interesting. Uh, competition breeds excellence. And, and whether that's products or standards, I, I think you're seeing that uh, to a degree where, where the, you know, the, the, the Wi-Fi standards bodies looked at what the market was doing and how the market was reacting and the trajectory. And it was certainly top of mind for them when they were looking at Wi-Fi 6. 
Yeah, I, I know. I, I know the five G industry. Right? Every time I, w- I went to a five G well live conference a year ago, um, uh, I would check the Wi Fi latency and ping time in the venue, and it was <laughs> always faster than the cellular network there, which I don't think won me with too many friends. Right, well, we've got um, uh, the poll results through. So if we have a quick look at those now, please. If you could push those to the screen, great. And um, okay, so ha- how important or um, how significant is six gigahertz to your business plan? Um, and it looks like very important and somewhat important are um, are both pretty high. And uh, there seem to be almost no naysayers, but there's quite a few who who, who don't have a feeling at the moment. Is is that accord with what what you see around the world, Scott? That's very consistent. I I, I think uh, those that are especially in the fixed wireless broadband space, uh, five gigahertz is is crowded in many uh, geos in, in local areas and six gigahertz will certainly open up significant opportunities just with clean spectrum, but also uh, the wide channels and the ability to to support up to gigabit to the edge is is pretty attractive for the ISPs that are gonna take advantage of it. Uh, So that that, that really doesn't surprise me very much at all. And as we were pointing out in the use cases, the wide channels in indoor Wi-Fi, I guess to a degree outdoor Wi-Fi as well, are gonna be necessary for some of the advanced applications that are being developed today, especially um, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality type of applications. And, I, and I'm also not surprised about the, uh, the I'm not sure. That that's probably a, a more appropriate position for, for many uh, enterprises today. If, if you're satisfying your users uh, today with, with five gigahertz and your, your phone's not ringing and you're not getting the text messages about uh, insufficient capacity, six gigahertz may not be necessary. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've seen some people suggest that the initial use of six gig before the clients arrive might be access point to access point. Is that something you're seeing as well? Well, that's an interesting point, uh, especially from a company like Cambium Networks, where we where we have a, a, the, the wireless fabric. We, we generally wouldn't lead with point to point applications using Wi-Fi APs. That, that's generally not something that we would recommend in general. Uh, I would suppose that six gigahertz uh, with the wider channels would, would, I guess, better enable that. Uh, but we, we wouldn't uh, contemplate the Wi-Fi protocol, if you will, as ideal for point-to-point applications like that. Okay. Um, there's a few questions that have come in. Um, there's one which, judging from the email addresses from someone in Spain, um, it says, you know, are there any plans to use the unlicensed, well, it's the 6.4 to 7.1, so it's the upper part of that band. Mm-hmm. So I presume that's one of those things that the answer is depends where you where you live. That's exactly right. So from a Cambio standpoint, operating globally uh, in 2020, we, we operated in, in more than 160 countries worldwide. And, and certainly uh, regulatory bodies like Etsy and the FCC and Anatel and Ifatel, they, they set uh, certainly in some respects global and others uh, trans, transnational uh, expectations and, and support. So it really just depends on where you live and, and what, what spectrum is available to you. And what Cambium looks at is, hey, is, is there a sufficient market opportunity with, within that specific region? And then you look more broadly on it. Is, is there an opportunity to really support the investment necessary? I, I think we're going to see some flex over the next few years as well, mm-hmm. as people sort of see the initial performance of, of 6E. And then also they start thinking about what do we need for 5G as well? I know the other the other the other outlier possibility here is that we might see some lo- of the local license spectrum bands available for for Wi-Fi use as well. I know that's been discussed by a few people I've talked to. That I think is true. You know, in today's uh, environment, it's a phenomenal place to be in, in wireless networking, and and I think the mantra in general is yes, it's self-serving, but I think it's true. Is if it can be done with wireless, it will be done with wireless. Uh, j- just to the the flexibility and the agility that that provides you. Well, in order to do that, it requires spectrum. And, and I think the regulatory bodies recognize that, the industry recognizes that, and the user community recognizes that. And collectively, there's, there's a, a more concerted effort now than ever in my 30 years of, of working in this space to open up spectrum. Whether it's unlicensed, lightly licensed, managed, there's an effort to get there. I, I, I'm definitely seeing that. Okay, so there's a few product questions in, that have come through, which maybe we can take our offline because they're quite specific. One last one, does six gigahertz compete with 60 gigahertz in any ways? I, I would say no, uh, and, and it goes to, in, in many respects, propagation 
uh, and and what the specific use case is. I, I would view them as complementary. Uh, we started shipping our 60 gig platform in December, and, and I can tell you one of the most common applications thus far is is transport for outdoor Wi-Fi access networks. Uh, so so you got you got Wi-Fi for client access. You you got 60 gig for transport. Uh, is is probably the way to think about it. Excellent. All right. Well, Scott, thank you very much for that indeed. Uh, and uh, that winds up this session. Um, at 50 past the hour, we've got the next session. You'll have to click on the um, the next presentation uh, link underneath uh, the video window. Uh, and in the meantime, please enjoy this, uh, this short uh, video from Cambium in the meantime. And then we'll move on to Rahul uh, from Qualcomm uh, talking about advanced wireless network uh, networking technologies. Thank you very much. And thanks, Scott, again. Thank you, Dean. Uh, my name is Roy Alexander. I am the business development manager for VisionNet Incorporated based out of Great Falls, Montana. We got into the, the managed Wi-Fi network space um, as a ask from one of our clients. The, the bottleneck, which are inherent in, in any network deployment, is no longer the wireless side. We had deployments of, of uh, uh, a mixed bag of different wireless equipment and different network equipment and things like that. Uh, I thought it was important to, to simplify that, unify it into one platform, uh, and, and a very important aspect of that platform is central management from a, uh, from a location. For us, it's the knock here in Great Falls, Montana. And, and so we went out and we looked at a number of vendors uh, and landed on Cambium for a couple of reasons. Um, one, the performance, two, the price point, and three, the, the corporate support behind it. It allows our techs to interact with those networks from a remote basis, allows our techs to react to alarms coming out of that. So the business results from that, of course, increase revenue uh, and, and noticeably increase customer satisfaction. Saves time, saves money, saves effort. 